Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us this afternoon on the Intersection webinar. I am James Michalowski, a policy analyst with the Hunt Institute, and we are very happy today to be joined by three terrific guests, um, philanthropic partners in the higher education space uh, who we're very excited to hear from. I'm going to start with two super brief housekeeping notes. The first is that if you want to follow along on social media or submit a question uh, through Twitter, please use the hashtag INTWebinar. Um, second brief note is that uh, we are going to have time at the end for audience Q&A. And so if you have a question, please submit it using the Q&A feature, which should be at the bottom of your screen. We are not going to be unmuting lines. So we ask that you do use the Q&A feature. Before we start the conversation, I'm going to turn things over to the Hunt Institute's president and CEO, Dr. Javed Siddiqui, for some brief welcoming remarks. Over to you, Javed. Thanks, James. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining us. I know we, we have a, a number of people with us this afternoon. So the reason we're having this specific conversation is because of the way uh, this major transition has enforced on all of us by the COVID-19 pandemic. It has been abrupt. And sometimes hard to pick your head up and reflect on how your organization's approach to the work has shifted in response to the crisis. Uh, but it's exactly what we're talking about today, reflections on how the pandemic has shifted the higher education landscape, how uh, we approach this work. There's clearly a huge amount of brand new challenges and student needs that have been caused by this pandemic. But at the same time, uh, some of the same higher education priorities that have uh, the field has that the field has prioritized for years have taken on new significance uh, in the wake of COVID-19. And it's something we at the Institute have been thinking about uh, pre-COVID and now during COVID, and hopefully uh, there'll be a post-COVID uh, upon us sooner than later, and we'll certainly be thinking about them in the post-COVID world as well. Uh, James will talk about that in context of two higher education projects that we completed recently, uh, actually just before the shutdown. But most importantly, I'm, I'm really excited to be joined by three great guests. Uh, joining us today, MC, uh, Belk Pylon, and Chuck Kaler from the John M. Belk Endowment and Susan Devaney from the J. Marion Sims Foundation. MC, Chuck, and Susan were our partners on the projects that James is gonna uh, describe here shortly. They're gonna get a chance to share their own perspectives on how this crisis has affected their work. Uh, I appreciate all three of you making time to be with us this afternoon and sharing your insights with, with our colleagues from across the country. Uh, that said, James, I'm gonna kick it back to you to get us going. Sounds good, thanks, Gervais. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about the Hunt Institute's perspective on how our work has evolved, um, and then I want to make sure to leave plenty of time for our guests um, to provide their valuable perspectives as well. Um, so like I think everyone on this call today um, at the Hunt Institute, we've had to make a number of adjustments to how we've approached, um, in particular, our higher education work uh, in this new normal. Um, and we've been doing a lot of thinking about how some of the programs and the platforms uh, and the publications that we had been producing before this pandemic, how those sorts of things translate um, into this post-COVID world. So I'll talk about that shift in the context of two projects. Um, the first is an issue brief series that Javed and I wrote together called Attainment for All. And the second is a project called the South Carolina Higher Education Advisory Committee. So I'll start with the Attainment for All series. This is a project we developed in partnership with MC and Chuck and their team at the John and Belk Endowment. Um, the purpose of this series was really to highlight some innovative strategies that state policymakers have been using to both raise post-secondary attainment rates while also narrowing equity gaps. Um, there's a lot of momentum around post-secondary attainment issues here in North Carolina. Uh, and across the country. And so we thought this series would be something that would be helpful to the field. Um, we released the first two briefs in the second half of 2019. The third brief <clears throat> it came out on a Wednesday in mid-March, and it ended up being the very last week that we were physically in our office before everything shut down. Um, so the, the pandemic brought a pretty abrupt end to that project. Um, the other project that I mentioned is the South Carolina Higher Education Advisory Committee, which Susan was a key part of. Again, you're going to hear from, from her shortly. Um, this advisory committee, we put it together in partnership with Dr. Rusty Monholland, who at the time had just become president and executive director of the South Carolina Commission on Higher Education. Um, and we also worked with Dr. Rob Anderson and his team at SHEO. And of course, as I mentioned, Susan and her team at, at J. Marion Sims Foundation. Um, this advisory committee project was really about putting together a committee of 
um, stakeholders who represented a variety of constituencies from across South Carolina. We brought them together for three in-person meetings um, and the committee members developed a set of policy recommendations and through a number of discussions, um, they sort of came to a broad consensus around a number of those policy recommendations. Um, we packaged a final report, which included the recommendations that the committee had produced. And Rusty was all set to present this report to his board on an April 1st meeting that, as you can probably guess, ended up being postponed. So both of these projects came right up to the finish line or sort of had a toe across the finish line. And then the pandemic happened and, and we um, hit pause in the immediate term. Uh, like Javed mentioned, um, and I think like many of you know, there, have a num there are a number of immediate needs that have popped up in the, in the wake of this pandemic. There are a lot of higher ed students who need support. There are a lot of institutions who are worried about their financial solvency. Um, and so we quickly pivoted to um, addressing these more immediate concerns through supporting policymakers as we can. Um, but at the same time, we have been reflecting on some of the work like the projects I mentioned and how those lessons learned and takeaways might translate into this, this new normal in the post-COVID world. Um, and in a nutshell, um, even though the landscape looks very different than we expected it to, um, we have found that a, a good number of the best practices and the lessons learned that we and also our partners in the higher ed field have been holding up and, and promoting for a number of years many of those things have become even more important in the wake of the pandemic and have taken on new resonance. Um, and in particular, <clears throat> through our conversations with policymakers, we've heard folks start to think about medium and long-term responses to this pandemic and what the landscape of education might look like uh, a year or two down the road. Um, <clears throat> and to the extent that those conversations involve policymakers rethinking what school looks like, both in the K-12 and in the higher ed space. Um, we think that a lot of the lessons learned and, and the evidence-based best practices that have emerged in recent years can be important guidance um, as policymakers think through some of these big picture questions. So that's some of the things we've been thinking about, it's probably more than enough from me. Um, and now I'd like to turn it over to our wonderful guests. Uh, we're gonna start with MC and Chuck, and then we'll go to Susan. <coughs> MC and Chuck, I wonder if you can kick us off by just saying a few words about the John and Belk Endowment and also how you both have been affected by this pandemic. Thanks, James. Um, I wanna thank the Hunt Institute for its vision and focus to prioritize attainment for all policy brief series. It was important pre-COVID and even more important post-COVID. I'm excited today to be discussing how COVID-19 has impacted the higher education sector and how um, our work supplements that. Here at the John Milk Endowment, our sole mission is to transform post-secondary education to meet our state's evolving workforce needs. Our mission has taken on a whole new level of importance over the last few months. COVID-19, as most of you know, has caused unprecedented disruption to life as we know it and affirmed the value of education as an essential service of our nation must provide across the education continuum from preschool to the workforce. The endowment has also been a driving force behind North Carolina's My Future NC post-secondary attainment goal to educate 2 million by 2030. This effort is a statewide cross-sector collaborative that is intentionally focused on how to educate and upskill North Carolina's homegrown and in-migrant workforce. The real juice is that this work has our state's education leaders at its nexus and we are excited to see this work move forward. As Javade and James mentioned, we worked with the Hunt Institute on the Attainment for All series to highlight different strategies to help students get high quality certificates, credentials, and degrees. As far as how the pandemic has affected us, it has given us time as an organization to hit the pause button and do a deeper dive into our portfolio. We've been reaching out to our grantees to better understand their needs and circumstances. We are doing our best to provide some additional stability and give them much needed encouragement during this learning curve. 
We are blessed to have our help and to be in a position where we can help support efforts to mitigate the damage that's been caused by the pandemic. With that, I'll hand it over to Chuck for his thoughts. Thanks, MC, and, and I'd love to echo your gratitude for the Hunt Institute's um, COVID-19 resources that they provided over the last few months. We, we, as a team, have relied heavily on that national perspective and those experiences that they're providing through their blog posts and policy briefs and, and their webinars. So thanks, Javade and team, for being a key part of our team's ongoing education and development. And, and, and I would just say that one of the most meaningful ways that COVID has impacted our team is to affirm some principles that in which we, we believe deeply, the first of which is relationships matter. Uh, I think back to some of those, those early phone calls that MC just referenced, uh, which I think was, was early March time, uh, talking to our grantees, talking to North Carolina's higher education leaders and, and, and listening, better understanding the vast landscape of needs and areas where we might plug in and support. Um, I, I also think about how we pre, pre our Zoom uh, integration, we're speaking to our fellow funders at Duke Energy and the North Carolina Community Foundation, Golden Leaf, the David Tepper Family Foundation, and so many others who have their fingers on the pulse of, of, of so many parts of the larger education workforce ecosystems. Th those conversations informed our thinking and, and response in a meaningful way and shined a light on the importance of strong partnerships and how we leverage those to be the best versions of ourselves that we can be. And, and I'll just end by saying that, that uh, we, we all have our personal stories on how COVID has impacted us, but professionally, our team acknowledges that our struggles pale in comparison to the challenges that are being faced by North Carolina students, parents, teachers, faculty, administrators, and leaders, uh, all across the education continuum from preschool to higher education. Um, we, we hear a lot about the, the hero designation for teachers and parents, nurses, and front frontline workers and, and um, first responders, which is, is, is well-deserved and long overdue. And we, we would love to add a, a Higher Ed Heroes Award for uh, President Hans of the Community College System and those 58 presidents and Dr. Roper at the UNC System and those 16 chancellors and President Williams at NCICU, our, our independent colleges and universities. Uh, and there are 36 um, presidents that, that have responded promptly and, and thoughtfully and were your biggest fans and look forward to cheering you on uh, as you navigate the path ahead. Wonderful. <clears throat> Thanks to you both. And uh, we certainly agree that there's been some heroic work happening um, in the higher education sector here in North Carolina. Susan, over to you. Uh, pretty similar question. I wonder if you can just talk a little bit about the J. Marion Sims Foundation um, and also how you have been affected by this pandemic. Sure, James. Thank you. It's wonderful to be with all of you this afternoon. Uh, you might see that I'm in my home. Um, actually, behind me is a uh, sleeping dog, and behind him is where my own students, my higher education students, spent the last eight weeks finishing their master's degree and uh, junior year at Furman University. And I think that's just a symbol of many of how our lives have been disrupted by the pandemic. Um, the J. Marion Sims Foundation is a place based health legacy foundation in the upper part of South Carolina, just south of Charlotte. We are rural in nature, our place. Uh, we have Chester and Lancaster counties in our scope, about 93,000. And uh, we are largely a first generation college going post textile community, uh, if, I, if I had to describe our community. Our work is all about striving to bring partners together to make the community healthier. And we know that a strong and robust education system from preschool through college makes a healthy community. So our work is very focused on programs and policies that support those kinds of supports for our students and their families. Um, I would say that about five years ago, we took a really deep dive as an organization to place a focus on this young adult transition to adulthood space. Uh, being a, an area in rural South Carolina that was declining in population, we started to wonder what were the needs of our young people and really take take that seriously as to how to build our own programs and public-private partnerships. We look to leaders in policy like the Hunt Institute to gather us, to give us best practices. We hope to use some of that knowledge and some of those networks to inform our work. I look forward to talking a little bit about some of how the COVID pandemic is changing our approach, but I would just echo, I think, what both Chuck and MC have said. 
this is a time for us to pull even more closely to our mission. It's a time to really um, leverage partnerships and really highlight what's happening to, to students. Uh, this is a time they need us more than ever. And I'm, I'm really pleased to be with leaders on this call this afternoon to, to hear how you're approaching it as well. Thank you, Susan. <clears throat> Student-centered approach has definitely been a big theme across the board. So glad to hear that that resonates with you as well. Um, I am now gonna ask a couple of opening questions um, and then we will have time for audience Q&A as I mentioned. Um, as a reminder, if you have questions, please submit them using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, first question is gonna go back to MC and Chuck. Um, kind of a general question. I wonder if you can talk about a little bit more specifically about how the endowments work has evolved and shifted in the wake of the pandemic and whether there were particular priorities you focused on previously that have become even more important um, or also whether there have been kind of new areas of, of uh, priority that have opened up in the last month or so. Would love if you could say a few words about that. Thanks, James. Um, as you and Javed talked about, a lot of the attainment goals and priorities that we focused on before the pandemic are even more relevant now. And the need has not only been more spotlighted, but it has increased. Margaret Spellings recently shared that the inequity of our education systems that existed before lockdowns are acutely seen now. And we see the same things. Pre-COVID, we worked hard on the post-secondary attainment because it is a strategy that aligns and coordinates an intentional plan to help students of all ages in North Carolina get the education and the skills they need to secure good jobs and support their families. But post-COVID, that goal is even more important than ever and is now our state's education economic recovery strategy. We talked about our work to support our community colleges in our opening remarks. And we know that these leaders will be on the front lines of training and retaining North Carolinians who may have experienced traumatic loss to income or jobs. Because of the pandemic, our state's most vulnerable populations need to be brought into the thinking and the planning of how we move forward post COVID. Before the stay at home orders, one of the things that we love to do was visit our community colleges in different regions of our state and sit down with their leaders and their students to hear and understand what was going on in their particular campus and how that fit into the larger ecosystem of our state community college system, as well as our higher education ecosystem. So that's not possible right now, but we just picked up the phone and started calling and texting our community college presidents instead and have had some virtual tours. We found that preserving these lines of communication, although they happen to be in different format now, has allowed us to have real valuable conversations with community college leaders that we value so much as they face these incredibly tough decisions. Chuck, what would you add? Yeah, MC, I, I, think, um, I think you're spot on. I don't, I don't think our priorities have changed at all. I think they're just now being amplified. Uh, we, we might have a few additional priorities that, that are they're on the list that we, we didn't expect, but, but our attention and energies here at the Belk Endowment are still very much centered on investing in organizations and leaders that are laser focused on helping North Carolina build the strongest talent development system possible. Um, I, I think what's changed for us as a team is really this doubling down on our investments to increase post-secondary access completion and, and a strong workforce uh, here in North Carolina and, and identifying areas where we can improve as a partner. Um, I think a, a big part of that, MC, back to what you mentioned earlier, this, this hitting pause and, and reflecting um, has been on, on our discovery that, that um, the importance of how we collaborate on strengthening organizations from the inside out by, by helping them invest in strong, healthy, and sustainable practices. And that, this, that, that feels especially true for the nonprofits that, that we support. Um, I, think that, I think we already knew that, that um, exceptional leadership and organizational culture and diversified funding streams, uh, nimble models were, were critical um, already, but, but um, 
but but so much more so when you're in the middle of a crisis like like the COVID pandemic. And and, and I think it affirmed the idea that um, that we need to remember that capacity for our partners to do their work well, no matter the environment that they're in, is is very very important. And and I'll I'll just end by saying that. Uh, you know, I, I keep coming back to these early stage phone calls and Zoom meetings where we were learning. And I, I just remember us speaking with um, our, our grant partners that were already supporting the community college system, for example, and thinking about how our partners at, at, at NC were, were, were helping people get together through their media coverage and connect in a way that they weren't doing beforehand. And um, our friends at the Belk Center were, were providing complimentary online transition support for our community colleges and Hunt Institute. You guys were putting together your COVID resources. Um, and, it, and it really spoke to us how, how we were very fortunate to have so many partners that were stepping above and beyond outside of the, their capacity to support and scaffold a, a higher education and, and students, communities, and campuses in a, in a very meaningful way. It was a very special moment for us as a team. Wonderful. Thank you both for sharing. Uh, it's very interesting. Do you mind if I just quickly jump in? Not at all. Um, sorry, just because I want to give, I think this pre-COVID speaks to a lot of what uh, MC, uh, her leadership, and, and Chuck, and the entire endowment team, the way you all brought your grantees together pre before COVID was even on the radar, it certainly naturally positioned us to have, it was just a, not, it was sort of subconscious. We were like, we all need to be coordinating. So, uh, I just wanted to give, I think that's a place where philanthropy really can be and should be leading and can be leading. Uh, and I thought you all have provided that leadership to us because we are we are so connected. We're speaking without you, uh, just so you know, your, your, your siblings are talking when y'all aren't around. So thanks to you all for prompting and really encouraging us to be more thoughtful partners. Sorry, James, just thought that was a good plug for philanthropy. I agree. Thank you, Jervain. That was very helpful. Um, and thanks to MC and Chuck. and. Now we'll turn back to Susan uh, for a similar question. Susan, I wonder if you can talk a little bit more specifically about um, the ways in which the foundation's work has evolved as a result of the pandemic. Sure, thanks James. And I love hearing the story about the Belk Endowment's um, connectivity to the college presidents. I can't imagine, I think the week of March the 9th, we were seeing college presidents set the tone for how this country responded uh, to the pandemic. So I was incredibly proud to be a part of, a, a philanthropic partner to higher education. I would say pre-COVID, our foundation's focus has always been on public-private partnerships that make life better for the residents that we serve. And we have found that as a result of the pandemic, those relationships with our public and private partners in this community and at the state level and at the national level have become amplified and even more important. Um, it is important to us and one of the ways that we drive our work uh, is to basically do the look at the nexus between what the data is telling us and also engage with the community and see what are the local engagement pulse points that really make the data shine. Uh, I can't tell you, uh, I think all of us agree that every day is a new opportunity to engage and to learn during the pandemic. So one of the things that our foundation has decided to do as a result of reflecting on how to stay connected uh, is to do a weekly convening. So we put a weekly convening on for our region and we invite community leaders to just talk straight up with the population about what are the ways that you're responding. So we have had our superintendents, our college president, our county leaders, our state delegation, giving the community direct information and direct encouragement about how to stay healthy and how to shine a light on the needs of residents. I don't think we're gonna change in our approach to being engaged partners. One of the ways that I'm really proud to see our work bend in terms of strategy to support students is really to do even more listening to youth so for years we've had, for example, a college internship program. We take a class of students every summer. We put them, we immerse them into the community. This year with this pandemic, I mean, right as our applications were closing, um, we were learning, we were not going to be open. Uh, we made a call after some, um, some reflection and talking to partners across the country 
to keep the internship open and we're doing it 100% virtual and asking those college students to spend some time reflecting on their own experience in this pandemic and how they would take that lens, the lens of, of an educated youth uh, into the community to make it better. So there, that's one example of, of something we're trying this year to be certain that the voices of youth and the perspectives of youth are helping us uh, look forward and, and ways that we can be supportive to our community and its residents. Wonderful. Thank you, Susan. I saw MC and Chuck nodding vigorously. So it sounds like some of those points were resonating. And <clears throat> I love both of your, all three of your examples of how you've pivoted to sort of preserve existing lines of communication and um, keep those conversations going at a time when uh, they're more important than ever. Uh, we've got some questions coming in. Um, a couple of them kind of touch on this issue of collaboration. Um, I know you've all mentioned this briefly. Chuck, you mentioned some of the additional philanthropic partners you've been um, putting your heads together with. Um, I wonder if you could all say a little bit more specifically about um, one question asked, how you've engaged with your fellow philanthropists to share best practices and needs that you're seeing in other states. Um, and there's also a question about sort of a comparative state perspective, whether you think that the needs of students and institutions of higher education in North and South Carolina um, are things that every state is dealing with, or whether there are certain common threads um, and certain unique circumstances for each, each state and each set of students. Um, so MC and Chuck, I'll turn to you to respond first, if you could talk a little bit more about that sort of comparative perspective that you've been hearing from your peers in the philanthropic space. Sure, sure. I think, um, you know, kind of being that safe space to foster innovation at the macro vision for attainment for all, for us doubling down on my future NC attainment goal to educate 2 million by 2030, but building up the micro missions for finding best practices and scaling attainment for all is where our time, talent, and treasure is focused. And in doing that, we have connected with so many funders, um, people that are in our space and people that aren't in our space that um, are doing really neat, innovative things like what Susan just spoke about. And I think everyone at this time knows the stress of the crisis, but you know, how can we come together too to help these institutions of education um, deal with these unprecedented times? I mean, and I guess more specifically, um, something, in building off of the My Future NC goal and really understanding our target populations in our state and how remote learning has impacted the inequity in our systems. Pre-COVID, the data spotlighted a major leak in our attainment pipeline with college access. But post-COVID, that spotlight is even brighter. And so College Advising Corps, one of our grantees, has been a high fire um, in the college access access space but due to covid in two weeks they educated and trained over 800 plus advisors nationwide to move to an e-advising platform to maintain support that college advising core provides to many of our high school young people to ensure that their dream to attend college even during and through and on the other side of the pandemic is achieved. And so this change in their business model comes with added expense, but, that, but provides an efficiency and an increased connectivity to college access barrier. And so as they've made these changes in such a quick time frame, but continuing to support a much needed population across our nation, it has been really been finding other heroes to help support and scale this work as well. And Susan mentioned um, their work with College Advising Corps in an earlier conversation. And so it's, you know, whether you're in North Carolina, South Carolina, or pick the state in the nation, we're all living through COVID. And so, you know, coming together only makes us stronger and we can learn from each other. I've learned so much on this call already. So I think that's one of the, 
the beauties of this. And thank you all for organizing us together to be able to learn from each other. Sure thing. Chuck, anything to add or should I go yeah. over to Susan? Yeah, I'll be, I'll, be, I'll be very brief to say we're, we're I, Susan, you said something earlier about pulling closely to your mission and it, and it makes me think about uh, how we as an organization are, are really um, being pulled into others' missions because even though, uh, you know, we, we work within the post-secondary and workforce spaces, but, but we, we, we have learned that there's this very large kind of ecosystem around the continuum um, from from preschool to the workforce, and there are so many factors that uh, impact a, a student of any age's ability to to move along and navigate that pathway to to a meaningful credential and, and a family sustaining wage. And we 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 have um, we I think we have in some incredible groups like the North Carolina Network of Grant Makers that are working very hard to to bring. Um, a variety of groups together to learn and, and I think what we need to do as, as funders is is better support um, efforts to to connect this very large landscape of needs um, to, to the resources that are available and that, that's just that's something that I think we we've struggled with a little bit internally is um, is 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 having some go-to sources where we, we can better understand where we can plug in, even if it's not nice and neat in, in the higher ed and um, workforce spaces. And so we've seen a lot of movement from groups here in North Carolina, and, and we appreciate that and, and hope that as we move out of COVID that, that there, th those resources will be there. So if, this, if a pandemic or any, any other type of issue happens again, or, or even if not, that we, we know how to better connect uh, resources to needs. Thanks, Chuck. <clears throat> um, we do have a number of other questions coming in. Susan, do you want to speak to that one or should I move to a question that's directly? The only thing I would add would be just be, you know, being mindful of those relationships you already have and being, um, being willing to step out and offer yourselves in new ways. I think it's what Chuck just said. Um, we have found ourselves being very connected to statewide uh, public private partnership conversations in new ways that keep us posted on ways that our mission but their missions can be advanced. Um, the final thing I would just say is in the spirit of serving students, um, we have found ourselves really redoubling our focus on listening to students. Um, I would like to see more about that at some point because I do think that's where um, we've got to begin and end is hearing where their needs are and then rallying those public and private partners, including our grantees around um, the table for how to support them in this, in this anxious time. Thank you, very helpful. Uh, we now have a flood of questions. I apologize if we are not able to get to yours uh, on this webinar, um, but I wanted to pivot now to a question that comes from Lil Hayes um, in the South Carolina legislature. Uh, it's directed at Susan, but we have a related follow-up that I think um, it would be great if you all could very briefly comment on. So Lil writes, um, knowing that one of the activities of J. Marion Sims Foundation is to have near peer mentors guide high school upperclassmen to post-secondary education, how does that work now that the students are not in school? Um, were there challenges that were complicated by IT accessibility issues? This is something that Caroline Sullivan also referenced in her question, asking about the digital divide. Um, and were the students who are normally at risk even more disadvantaged than usual? How did y'all deal with that? Um, Susan, I'd love if you can start at MC and Chuck. I know that near peer advising is a priority for y'all as well. So maybe you can follow up on Susan's response with some thoughts of your own. Susan? Great, thank you, James, and hi, Lil. It's great to hear from you. Uh, yes, I think um, for all three of us, the focus on near peer advising has been a part of our work for a number of years. We are partnered with Furman University to offer the College Advising Corps near peer program in all of the high schools that we support. And, and essentially, this is a model that provides a recent baccalaureate student uh, trained to be an advisor as an extra resource to a high school guidance counselor um, unit so that you've got someone who looks almost like a student supporting students who are getting ready to go into that college seeking arena, uh, giving them some encouragement, helping them with their thoughts it is very relational. It's very one on one. And you've asked exactly the right question. What happens when you don't have students in front of you? Um, MC described how quickly the National College Advising Corps 
got on point with training to help our advisors become e-advisors. So I'd say this, the relationships that were already built by the advisors in the schools were tight and were strong. They were strong enough to withstand that COVID barrier. The broadband, the broadband access issues are real. Living in rural South Carolina, we have found a number of areas where our students, whether they have computers or not, cannot uh, access their lessons, they cannot access the news. Um, we hope that Congress is taking a close look at this um, for its future funding because it's an infrastructure issue for education and for health. Um, but we really have been proud of our partners, in our case, uh, Furman University College Advising Course serving Chester and Lancaster. They pivoted instantly, reimagined how to stay very connected to those students with support of their schools and uh, the local colleges. Thanks, Susan. MC and Chuck, anything to add? Sure, real quick, I'll say, you know, um, COVID has really impacted the whole education continuum. And so when you think about the digital divide, um, we've heard from our partners and have seen opportunity to leverage our state's education expertise in this area. One, by supporting our education leaders and how they're experiencing the unevenness with technology and broadband access and to the connectivity between the education transition leaders such as relationships between superintendents and community college presidents we're only stronger together and so as our education system serves the same student along the continuum it's critical that the cross-sector alignment and collaboration among education leaders is strengthened and this critical leadership connections will help our state come up with a plan to increase connectivity for all and start thinking about broadband as the new utility. And, you know, we started out in sort of rural North Carolina, but through this have really been exposed to medium and large urban cities that don't have the access that a lot of people assumed that they do throughout the whole districts. And so um, I think this is a topic that has been out there swirling and has impacted the business sector, but um, has really hit the education sector hard with this overnight light switch, remote learning connectivity point. Thanks MC. Chuck, anything else? Uh, here, here to Susan and MC. That works. <laughs> um, and maybe the last question uh, comes from Roy Jones, who asks, we have been learning about how COVID-19 has particularly impacted black and brown populations in our country and state. What specific diversity initiatives have your organizations made prior or in response to the crisis? Um, and I'll just add, this reminds me of part of a previous conversation we had where Angela Sanchez from the ECMC Foundation talked about sort of the intersectionality of the student need that's out there and the need to think about diversity and equity. Um, so maybe you all could talk a little bit about how equity concerns have factored in to the responses that you've been helping to support. Um, MC and Chuck, it looks like you want to take this one first. I think um, this is so important. There are so many um, parts of our population that aren't being served to the full capacity. And something like this really spotlights um, the unevenness. And so, you know, a lot of the data with that's associated with the leaky pipeline spotlights African Americans and Latinos and kind of how they fit into this equation or how they haven't been best served in this equation. And I think we have an opportunity with COVID and the remote learning piece again to, to think about how we're investing with um, leaders of color and really having them at tables to help be part of the solution rather than coming up with a solution for them because they're the experts on what they need. And so, you know, always keeping them in mind and having them be a part of the solution. 
Yeah, and I, MC, I, I would I would say let's give a shout out to Jason Terrell at Profound Gentleman who who's doing exactly what you're talking about and helping identify, recruit, and retain uh, male teachers of color here in North Carolina at one of, of the only, if not the only, nonprofits that that is 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 taking that on and doing a fine job of it. And we're very fortunate to know Jason and um, and be connected to learn from him and his work. And and I think Roy asks a great question and, and if you guys will allow we'll maybe narrow in on one one very kind of pointed area that our team is looking at and um, again this is a pre-existing priority but you know we're, we're always researching new ways to get ahead of, of some of these leaks along the post-secondary pipeline and one of those is the high school to a very important one of those is the high school to college transition um, and, and there's a, a promising and very recent initiative underway being led by our friends at the Belk Center for Community College Leadership and Research in partnership with My Future NC uh, here in North Carolina to, to do a, a college and career advising landscape analysis to better understand um, the advisors and coaches and mentors that are working out across North Carolina, but more specifically, what, what does it look like when we are able to provide equitable, high quality advising all across our state? Um, what, what is a more aligned and coordinated approach between providers and school look like? Our, our school counselors here in North Carolina are amazing and, 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 and have so much on their plate. So we, we truly, truly believe that the near peer advisors and, and coaches of all types are, are critical, but we need to find ways to better align their efforts and make sure that we are looking across the states to where students of color and rural students uh, low-income students, first-gen students, are, are maybe don't have the same access to that, the advising that they need to navigate the, the college admissions process. So uh, something ongoing that, that we hope to have a little bit more information um, by the end of this summer to inform the work that we do at the Belk Endowment, but what our, our attainment nonprofit, My Future NC, is leading to increase our um, high-quality credentials and degrees by 2030. Great. Thanks to you both. It's <clears throat> clear that this has been an approach that you take to the work for, for quite some time that's become even more important um, in the wake of this pandemic. Susan, I wonder if you can say a few words. This is an important topic, so we want to make sure that folks... Yeah, have it is. Thank you, James. And um, to echo my colleagues, I, I think educational equity is uh, an issue for all time. And uh, South Carolina has been focused on it actually legally since 2006 to ensure that our systems of support are there for all families and for all kids. At the foundation, our, our approach is to encourage healthy and robust communities so that all people can thrive. So where better to do that where, than where all the kids are? And that's within the education system from preschool through college. Um, I would say just to add uh, a, maybe a fine point on the college transition period, this, this pandemic I think has caused, um, well it's caused students to stay home for their health. We're very worried and we're watching um, the dropout rate. We do not want to see educational attainment uh, go backwards. We want to encourage in all ways students to uh, finish their high school diplomas, to take steps to encourage and to support one another as they look at possible higher education, post-secondary high edu higher education opportunities. And I would say the Hunt Institute did a really nice job in South Carolina of convening stakeholders together to look at policies and the kinds of data that are um, really around inequitable policies and how some students maybe are falling through the cracks. We can't have that. We have to have all people thrive if we want a healthy South Carolina, if we want a robust economy in the Southeastern United States. So I'm really excited about what will happen with those policy reports. I know they were completed before COVID, but they're just as important now. And maybe they're a lens through which we can examine opportunities to do things uh, differently. I think MC said this as we got started, the virtual universe is here to stay. And so how can we take what is working in this virtual space, apply it to education and increase access? Uh, there's some work to do there. And I look forward to being a part of it and uh, along with my colleagues here on this phone call. Thank you, Susan. That was a pretty much perfect way to transition to the closing of this webinar. Uh, we appreciate everyone spending their time with us. We really appreciate our three wonderful guests for sharing their insight and perspective. Um, I know we at the Hunt Institute learned a lot, and I'm sure that all of our attendees did as well. Um, a couple of super brief notes from me before we wrap up. Wanted to flag some upcoming programming um, that you all might be interested in. As you see, we've got a few webinars coming up 
On May 21st, we will be in conversation with the state chiefs from Missouri, Oklahoma, Pennsylvania, and West Virginia. Then on May 28th, we're gonna hear from the Lieutenant Governors of Michigan and Illinois. And lastly, or not lastly, but next in the sequence, on June 4th, uh, we're gonna have another conversation with state chiefs, this time from Colorado, New Mexico, and New York. And we'd also encourage you to check out the Hunt Institute's COVID-19 landing page. Um, it's something that we update regularly, um, and that contains a bunch of good resources that could be helpful in developing policy responses to the pandemic. That's it for us. Thanks again to all the attendees and to our fantastic guests. Um, we look forward to seeing you again at the intersection.